Morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Good. Man, I don't know, Dylan, you first you mansplain the uh, ladies event, and then you make a Broncos joke. I think we're going to have to revoke your ordination. <clears throat> Dangerous territory. Hey, uh, I know tomorrow's Veterans Day. Do we have any veterans in the room? Oh, we already did that? Where was I? I don't know where I, where was I? Yeah, I was, yeah. Raise your hand again. We'll honor you again. There we go. Come on, let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> I appreciate it. Right? We already did that. <laughs> it's great. I, I've, I'm discovering that uh, about once a year, around this time of year, I lose my voice. And I don't know why. It's just part of my annual rhythm now, I guess. So if any of you guys have any you know, preventative measures I should be taking, I will gladly hear it. Otherwise, I'll be preaching with uh, some hot uh, you know, tea and be taking dramatic pauses uh, throughout this message. So appreciate you guys sticking with me. You know, when I was a kid, I grew up in the 90s. I had the, uh, if you're a millennial, it was considered the idyllic, you know, 90s, uh, pre-internet, you know, playing hockey like Wayne's World on your, on, on the streets, and then, you know, moving things to the side when the cars come, and uh, we had a great time. Pokemon cards, Tamagotchi, it was a great time. Anybody relate to me? Okay, a few people. A lot less than I thought. Okay. Um, but one of the things that was popular was in the 80s and 90s was, you guys remember, there was a lot of, a lot of like anti-bullying movies, you know, where it was like, it was all about, and whenever you'd get bullied, the phrase everyone would say is, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, which is just not true, <laughs> right? It's partly true, but it's not totally true, because Words do kind of hurt sometimes, right? It's like you imagine this kid being told by their, their loving parent, just, hey, sticks and stones may break your bones, but words can never hurt you. And they're on the playground just like, oh, sticks and stones, you know, like, they're like this is not working, you know? And then the pendulum just swings from between then and now. Today, it's the exact opposite. It's like words are literal violence, you know, words are literal violence. You know, you're aggressing toward me, and, and you're like, oh, I didn't think so. I, like, misspoke, and all of a sudden, this is physical abuse or something. And, uh, you know, our world likes to swing pendulums between the extremes, and often the truth is somewhere in between or, or even above. And, you know, as we see as, uh, as believers, we want to know. What is, the, what is the real power in our language? There's uh, different studies that find that humans generally speak around 16,000 words a day. It probably depends on if you're female or male, you know? I think maybe there's a different number there. But a big part of our, our life is speaking, and you'll find the Bible actually has a lot to say about the words that we speak and how we should approach the words that we speak. But is which of these conventional wisdom is true? Is it that words are, are powerless and, hey, they're not sticks and stones, they can't really do anything? Or are they literal violence? You know, which is it? And in the, in the Proverbs 18, uh, Solomon tells us that death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit. So death and life are in the power of the tongue. So on one hand, Solomon is telling us that words are actually way more powerful than most of us probably give them credit for. There's life and death in the power of the tongue. And so it's kind of, okay, uh, words can hurt. So sticks and stones, you know, that's not totally true. Uh, but we're not God also. So how did God create the world? What did he use? Words. Words. And he made the universe with his words. He cre spoke and everything came into existence, including you and I. He made us. So you and I are not God. We're created beings, right? And so we take after God because we're made in his image, but we're not God himself. And so we, we're, we're both, we have dignity and humility. We're made in the image of God, which none of the other creations made in the image, in the image of God. But we're also created beings. We're not God ourselves. And so only God can create 
only his words are all powerful, but our words still have some power to them somehow, right? And so how do we figure out what that looks like? Well, this is why I really like the way Eugene Peterson phrases this in the message of the proverb we just read. He says, words kill and words give life. They're either poison or fruit. You get to choose. You get to choose. You see, in the, in the, river, the original proverb, he says, those who love it will eat its fruit. And you're like, well, that's really vague. What does that mean? Like, is that a threat? Is that a caution? And it's, it's almost like he leaves it intentionally vague. Like, you get to choose. Words are powerful. Are you going to use them for life? Or are you going to use them for death? And so we're ending our series today called um, Seven Habits of Highly Effective Disciples. And our seventh habit here that we're talking about today is highly effective disciples use their words. Like when you're talking to your child, use your words, honey. Use your words. That's the Lord just to us today. Use your words. Come on. Okay? So we've already mentioned there's a scale between two extremes. On one side of the extreme, there's words are powerless. Words are meaningless. It really doesn't matter what you say because they're not really that powerful. And then on the other side, you have words are all powerful. They're literal violence uh, or you even have things like witchcraft. If you say the right phrase, it changes something in the universe. And you have manifestation, which is kind of popular right now. If you just speak it into the universe, the power of your words will reverberate and echo and bring about the thing that you want. Whereas on the other side is more like nihilism, fatalism. You just, whatever will be, will be. You find that the Bible is really somewhere in between. That life and death are in the power of the tongue, but we're not all powerful like only God is. I find it's kind of like kind of like a mosaic. A lot of times a mosaic is used with, with materials that already exist, you know, glass, pottery, different pieces, and they, they pick up these broken pieces that someone else made. Someone else made a glass bottle. Someone else made this piece of pottery, and then someone else, you know, breaks it down, and they repurpose those materials to make a piece of art. That's a little bit how we create as image bearers. We don't make the original pieces, but we use the things that God created to make something beautiful. Isn't that how we make our world? Erwin McManus has this phrase. He says, world, words make worlds. Words make worlds. And I think you found this to be true when maybe you go to a friend's house and just the environment of their home is like more life-giving. Have you guys been around that? You just walk around. Maybe you have certain friends that are like this. You just like being around them because it's just the way that they are, the way that they speak, the way they communicate, the way they treat you. It's just, man, there's something about it. You can't get enough of it. But then you go hang out with other people. Maybe you have family members. Maybe you avoid Thanksgiving with your family because of this. And it's not quite like that, is it? It's like, ah, I feel worse. I, I, I'm more insecure. And why? Because the words that we use actually do create environments. They create cultures. They create the way that we experience the world. And so the words that we use matter. And so I want to talk about two ways that we can use our words as disciples of Jesus. One, we're going to use our words toward other people, and two, we're going to use our words toward ourselves. And in the Bible, there's no greater friendship than the friendship between Jonathan and David. Um, I picked him because he's the guy I was named after. My full name is Jonathan, if you didn't know that. And in 1 Samuel, uh, it really outlines over most of the book of Samuel the friendship between David and Jonathan. David is, is anointed to be king of Israel, but is not yet king. And Jonathan is the son of the current king who's about to be displaced by David. So you would think they're enemies. Because David is going to be the reason Jonathan is not king in the future. But what happens? Jonathan sees he has more more awe for the living God than he does the position of wanting to be king in the future. And so Jonathan knows God has appointed David to be king, even though, you know, it looks like maybe I could be king. Really, God wants him to be king. And then he just, he just sees something. Man, this is a good guy. I like him. And they become really good friends. And there's at one point where David is in trouble. And in 1 Samuel 20, Jonathan goes to encourage his friend David. And I, uh, this, I read this recently in the last couple of weeks, and this stuck out to me in a way I've, I've never noticed this before. 
in 1 Samuel 20, verse 16, it says, Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David. Now, we're going to talk about covenants in a few weeks, um, but a covenant is a relational commitment. It means I'm all in with you. I'm all in with you. And whatever I have is now yours. I'm all in with, with you. And Jonathan and David make a lot of covenants. They make three different covenants toward each other, toward the, God, the purposes of God on each other's lives. And, and what's interesting about this phrase to me is it's the only time that Jonathan doesn't just make a covenant with David as a person. He says, David, I'll make a covenant with you. This time it says he makes a covenant with the house of David. And I thought this was really interesting because the house of David represents the bloodline of David, the royal line of David. It represents what David would become in the hands of God. He would become the king of, of Israel. And the lineage of, of David, Jonathan, I don't think, knew this fully, but eventually led to Jesus. And so Jonathan sees something of the future of David's life. He sees what David's life could become in the future if God has his way in David's life. And Jonathan doesn't just covenant himself with David as a nice friend. Well, David, you're nice to me. We have the same interests. We get along. I'll be nice to you back. No, he sees the future of what David could be, and he covenants himself with David's future. Do you guys see that? Do you see how this is a little different than most of our friendships today, which are more like tit-for-tat contracts, like, well, you like this, I like that, so then I will allow us to be friends. You know, you like new girl, I like new girl. What are the odds? We should hang out, right? And that's not how it is. He sees who David could be in the hands of God. And this is, this is just incredible because he says, I'm not just all in with you as a person, I'm all in with your future. I'm all in with who you will become in the hands of God. Man, what if you had friends like that? Do you have friends like that? You know, sometimes people are like, hey, you're stronger than that. Come on, you're bigger than that. What are they saying? They're saying, I see what you really could become, and this, this ain't it right now. And so it's kind of a backhanded compliment. You know, it's kind of like, okay, hey, you're missing it right now, but you could be so much bigger, and I see it. And uh, in a few chapters, we'll see that David gets himself in trouble again, and he really starts to doubt himself. And in the context of this relational covenant, Jonathan shows up in Samuel 23, and it says, Jonathan rose and went to David and strengthened his hand in God. Da Jonathan strengthens David's hand in God. You're like, that's an interesting phrase. Like, what does that even mean? Like, he gave them a, a workout. They did a quick chest pump. Like, what did they do here? And he strengthened his hand. Well, it actually tells us what he did in verse 17. He says to him, do not fear, for the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find you, and you shall be king over Israel, and I shall be next to you. Saul, my father, also knows this. And the two of them made another covenant before the Lord. So how did Jonathan strengthen David's hand in God? He used his words. He spoke things to him to encourage him. He told him the truth. And when you tell people what is true, that's one way we can encourage and strengthen people. He says, hey, let me tell you what I see about you. Let me tell you what I see God doing in your life. I know it feels like all this is going to hell in a handbasket, but let me tell you what I see. And the word encourage is this amazing word. It, it mean, it's originally from the French like 500 years ago. It's en and courage. And en, you would think, it just means in. It means in, but it also means to make or to put in. And so it's to make courage and put it into someone else. That's what the word encourage means. So it's not just, oh, you look nice today. You look great. You got a little sparkle in your eye. No, it's, it's I'm making courage, and I'm shoving it into your chest because you don't have enough for yourself. That's what it means to encourage a friend. And why does Jonathan do it? Not just because 
David's having a bad day. No, because he sees there's a disconnect between what David is currently experiencing and the future that Jonathan covenanted himself with. There's a gap. And so I'm going to close the gap by filling you with courage so that you can become who God has made you to be. Come on, how many of y'all need some friends like that? I need some friends like that. It's amazing. You know, there's uh, this, this idea. You know, our culture loves this idea of love, and God, God is love, and God loves you. And all, all, it's like all we're allowed to talk about is the love of God. And the love of God is, is so, so amazing. But did you know that God doesn't just love you for who you are right now? He does love you for who you are right now, but he actually loves you even more because of who you will become because of his love. Think about that. I made this little graph. Check out this graph. I like graphs right here. So this is you when you're born. You're born dead, you know, spiritually dead, insecure, full of fear, shame, you know, all of that. Uh, and then you get saved. You, you, you give your life to Jesus. You get born again. Boom. This think of the, the, the vertical axis is kind of like the spiritual vitality or, you know, what percent of your true identity in God you're experiencing. Okay? And then this is time. So you're, you're just growing, and it's messy. It's not just a straight vertical line. You know, so you have good days, you have bad days, and, you know, maybe seasons that are better than other seasons. And then, but then you eventually have a breakthrough because God's not done with you yet, you know. And uh, so you keep kind of upward trajectory, and then eventually you'll never fully become who God has made you to be in this life. But then you, you die, and in the new heavens and the new earth, in the presence of God, Boom, you are fully who God made you to be. And you know when God looks at you today, God sees in two realities. He sees the reality of who you are right now. He, he, he's not blind. He's not an idiot. He'll be like, oh, hey, man, you're kind of insecure, coping. Really, you're going to cope with that again? Like, man, that didn't help you last time. But really, ultimately, what does he see? He sees this. He sees that's who you are. That's, that's who you are. And so when, he's, when, when God is talking to you about who you are, he's not telling you this, and he's definitely not telling you this. The Lord, you know, sometimes we, we have this terrible inner dialogue, don't we? Like we would never talk to other people the way we talk to ourselves. And sometimes the, the best question is to ask, like, who's telling me that? Like, is that the Lord telling me that? Or is that the devil telling me that? Because the Lord rarely is like, do you remember how terrible you were back then? Do you remember all the failures you made? Like, you're such a terrible person. Why do people even like you? I, generally, that's not from the Lord. So what are the other options here? Like, who else could be saying that to you? No, generally, when God is, is speaking to you, it's out of this reality. This is who you are. You are my son. You are my daughter. You are an overcomer. You're a champion. You're someone who works through problems. You're not someone who gets stuck. You're someone who, who moves forward. You're filled with the Spirit of God. You're filled with the power of God. You, you are someone who miracles follow you everywhere you go. You're someone who makes an impact in the world. That's how God sees you. And so he sees both realities. And, you know, while you're here, he still sees that because that's who you're becoming. And so all of these are, are true. It's who you were is true. Who you are today is true. But what is most true about you is who you are becoming today through the power of God. It's amazing. <clears throat> you know, Jonathan didn't just make up a bunch of stuff to encourage his friend to make him feel better. You know, like, it's okay. You can do it. You know, screw that guy. You're, you're, you're an amazing, you know, you're girl boss. No, he's, he sees what God says is true. He says, I already know what God says is true because God told us what he says is true. God says you're going to be king, so guess what? I believe God over your circumstances. And so he's just reminding him, agreeing with what God said. God said you're going to be king, so you're going to be king. So I know it doesn't feel like it, but maybe rise up a little bit as a man because what God says is true, you're going to be king someday. It's amazing. It's kind of like when you invest in the stock market you don't buy a stock because it's already worth a lot, you know? And, I mean, this is beginner investing advice, okay? I'm not, like, I'm not a financial planner. But generally, you buy a stock because 
of the value it will have in the future, not because if it's peaked currently. You know, if it's peaked, you just wasted your money, I'm sorry, or I don't know, maybe you're shorting stocks. I don't really get how all that works. But that's what encouragement is. Encouragement is I'm, I'm d- making a deposit on your future. I'm making a deposit. I'm making an investment because I'm betting that my investment will cause you to increase in value in the future because I see what your value could be in the time to come. And what if we thought of encouragement like that? I'm like, like sometimes we think of encouragement as like, it's like I need to get you from negative back to baseline value. You know, you're sad, so that's negative. I just need to get you back to neutral so you feel better about life. That's not really what encur- encouragement is. Man, the future is bright, and if you want to change the world, it's going to take us moving in that direction. So how can I get you out of the basement and up into the mountains moving in that direction? That's what encouragement is. And let me tell you, there's nothing worse than fake encouragement. You guys had that before? I, uh, friend maybe isn't the right word. I had a coworker years ago who uh, we had just an a intense kind of personality conflict. We just did not get along. And you ever have people around you, you just, you just kind of know, like, I know they just don't like me, you know, for whatever reason. And, uh, I mean, I don't know who wouldn't like me, you know, but... I'm kidding. But we just couldn't get along. And, and so I think, in part, I think this person was really trying to, you know, um, approach the relationship in kind of a friendlier way. And, but but the, one of the things this person started doing was just kind of throwing generic compliments at me all the time. And so be like, hey, John, you're great. Hey, John, you're really cool. Hey, John, you're awesome. And I was like, I don't believe you. Like, and literally everything else in our interaction says the exact opposite. You're just throwing these generic <laughs> encouragements at me. Like, I, I just don't believe that what you're saying is true, you know? Now, contrast that with several people throughout my life would stop me. Even in high school, when I was just the most insecure, shy, fearful, you know, idolatrous person, you know, in the world. And, and they, they would say, hey, you're going to be a pastor someday. And at the time, I thought it was more like a curse, like, how dare you? (laughs) You know? Three times in my childhood and teen years, three different people that I didn't know, three times, came up to me and said, you're going to be a pastor someday. My dad was a pastor, and I was not a fan. And so I was like, don't put that black magic on me, you know? But what is it? It's, it's, It's not just generic, like, you're great, you're awesome, you're nice, you're this, you're that. It's, I see something of value in you, and you need to know about it. I'm filling you with courage. I'm helping you become the person God is making you to be. That's what real encouragement is. The best encouragement is, if you can put that graph back up there, the best encouragement is you and I standing here in the present, and from the present, I'm like pulling out a spiritual lasso, and I'm lassoing you in the future, and I'm dragging it, kicking and screaming into the present. That's the best form of encouragement. I'm bringing the the future into the present. The future you that God had in his mind when he made you, the ultimate, perfect, confident, not insecure, not fearful, the courageous, impactful person that God had in his mind when he made you, and you're dragging that more into the present. That's what real encouragement is. And let me tell you, the people around you need that. Your friends need that. Your spouse needs that. Your kids need that. They need you to get off your phone and get out of the trip of your own life and stop just navel-gazing yourself. They need you to stop and pay attention at them and say, man, what is God doing in this person's life? And how can I start pointing it out with my words? How can I say it out loud to fill them with courage to become who God has made them to be? That's what your people need. And so you got to, Make a practice of speaking to other people. On the other hand, what do you do when your friends just aren't around or maybe aren't in a place to encourage you when you need it? How do you speak to yourself? Well, David, again, was in a really bad situation one time. He takes his military group out on a mission. While they're out on a mission, their camp gets raided by bad guys. The bad guys kidnap their wives, their kids, and all their stuff. And so they come home from the mission to see 
all their loved ones are gone. In their minds, they're probably dead. And so what happens? The men turn to David and they say, David, this is your fault. We're going to kill you. That'll make us feel better about the situation. Bad situation. No friends around in that situation to encourage him. Like, hey, uh, I could use some encouragement. Like, now we're going to kill you. And in 1 Samuel 30, it says, David was greatly distressed. I think that's putting it lightly. For the people spoke of stoning him. That's killing him with rocks. That's not maybe the easiest way to go out. And so what does David do? It says, David strengthened himself in the Lord. David strengthened himself in the Lord, his God. So what, what Jonathan had done for him before, now David was able to do for himself. He speaks the truth about himself. He reminds himself. He encourages himself. He fills himself with courage, reminding himself, this is what I know is true. God told me I would be king one day. I'm not king yet, so these guys can't kill me right now. God's going to do something I'm not aware of. He fills himself with courage. And we see this in several of the Psalms. In Psalm 103, uh, David writes, he says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Okay, so who is David talking to in this sentence? He's talking to his own soul. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And there's an exclamation point at the end of the sentence. This is like a command. So what's he doing? He's commanding his own soul to praise God. He said, hey, I know it looks rough my, right now, but you need to praise God. You need to remind yourself of what is true. And that's what he does. He says, he starts saying out loud, uses his words. He says, bless the Lord. Don't forget God's benefits. Who forgives all your iniquity. He heals all your diseases. What kind of a God do you serve who's going to make you king? He's the God who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Man, that's what it is. That's how you strengthen yourself. You tell yourself the truth. Let me tell you the truth, not the truth that, that your, your fallen, sinful nature, tempted by the devil, wants to tell you, like, you're a failure. You suck. No one likes you. That's not the real truth. The real truth is up there. It's who God made you to be. It's who God is. Then let me tell you, God has changed my life. The Holy Spirit is not done with me yet. The Holy Spirit has done this and this and this and this. And guess what? God is going to do something similar in this situation. God's not done with me yet. You're telling yourself the truth. In Psalm 42, one of David's disciples writes this psalm. And three different times in the psalm, he says, Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? And then he commands his soul, Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Some of you all need to memorize that sentence and tell yourself that every day. O my soul, why are you cast down within me? You are going to hope again in the Lord. How can you, like, you need to be able to encourage yourself if you're going to be successful in this life. Life is hard. Life is hard, isn't it? And sometimes, you don't, you're, you know, we all have stuff going on. And I pray that we would all get better at encouraging one another. But, hey, guess what? Sometimes your friends are going through their own stuff. You know, you, you need to be able to have the skill to stir your own faith and encourage yourself. And if you don't do that, then odds are you probably won't have much to offer your friends when they need you to do that for them either. And so you've got to be able to use your words to speak the truth to yourself because when your life is more in alignment with what God says is true, life goes better. Okay? I'm, I'm sorry, computer person, but if you could just put the graph up one more time. When you speak to yourself... It needs to be like that. Like, this is who I am. This is the way my life will go. This is who God has made me to be. This is what God has called me to do. Even though it doesn't look like that in reality, you're becoming that person. Your reality will become that kind of a person. And it's not just feel-good mantras. It's, I am coming, I'm convincing myself to come into alignment with the reality of what God says is true. I believe God over my circumstances. 
you know, psychologists, I love it when psychologists always, like, do these studies and affirm truths from the Bible. Isn't that amazing? And recently, this is a little bit small, but it's cool still. Psychologists, uh, they gave 20 people the name, of, the name of an object in a supermarket that they wanted those people to find, like a loaf of bread or an apple. And there was two groups. During the first group, they said, you are not allowed to make a sound. You need to be silent the entire time. Now go find the thing we told you to find. And then the second group, they told them to find the same object, but they had to keep saying the object out loud over and over and over until they got it. They found that the people who had to say it out loud found it almost twice as fast as the people who are bound to silence. It's interesting, saying things out loud sparks memory. It solidifies the end game of what you're trying to accomplish, and it makes it more tangible. So according to the psychologists, they said that talking out loud to yourself helps you validate important and difficult decisions. It helps you clarify your thoughts. It helps you tend to what's important. It helps you firm up any decisions that you're contemplating. It, like, makes it real. Why? Because God created things through his words. It's almost like we're made in his image and our words matter and bring things of value into the world as well. Now, again, you can, be, you can easily take this too far to, like, you know, Christian witchcraft and manifestation, you know, like, every word I say will come true. Hey, you're not Jesus, okay? And so there's this middle ground where I can say positive and negative things. So there's one temptation is I can't say anything never. I need to only speak life all the time. Well, I mean, part of life is addressing problems. If you can't be real about what problems are, then you can't move forward from a problem to solve it. But on the other hand, making identity value statements about yourself that are negative all the time is also not a good way to go. And so we live in a kind of a both end where my words are powerful, but they're not all powerful. And, and what I say does matter more often than I think. And so how do we do this? Well, there's one thing, we have these, and uh, you can find these. We'll put these on our website. Uh, we'll maybe e email them out to the church in a PDF you can make for yourself. But these are declarations to grow your faith. And if you're looking for one way to practice how to use your words well over your own life and give you ammo for when your friends need encouragement, you can start saying the words that are on this paper every day. And I have a rule for these. We... Uh, we, we'll send these out this week so you can have a copy of these. I have, my rule is you're not allowed to read this in your head, okay? This is just, it's just truth from Bible copy and pasted onto this paper in different categories like faith, health, you know, victory, your identity. So the first sentence, let me, I'll just read one out loud and see how, you, you can see how I feel about it, okay? Apart from Jesus Christ, I can do nothing. But in Jesus Christ, I can do all things. Ooh, I'm already feeling better. This is great. So I can bring glory to him. Therefore, I see myself as he sees me, according to his living word. For my life is hidden with Christ in God. I will train myself to say the same things as God says in his word. For how can two walk together except they be agreed? Through regular time in his presence, I will cultivate a sensitivity to hearing his voice. Man, some of y'all are like, I just never hear God. Well, guess what? I will cultivate a sensitivity because I will build relationship with God. I'm using my words to move the direction of my life in a certain direction because that's who God has made me to be. My words matter. You guys see what I'm saying? Some of y'all need to practice this like every day. Some of y'all need to practice this like maybe five times a day. I don't know. But let me tell you this. The world we're living in is forming us into specific kinds of people and it's not forming you into God's version of you. And so we need to actively embrace a process of counterformation. See, you're not at neutral right now. You've been formed by the world in many ways. And so you need to be counterformed by the kingdom of God. And so as we close this series on habits and rhythms, which can feel kind of unspiritual, like habits, you know, it's not very spiritual, but what you do every day matters. And what's often the case is the way that our modern culture is forming you is actually not 
primarily intellectual. Like the culture is not, you know, you're not watching Netflix and it's not just like, hey, read this philosophy book real quick. No, it's like the world is training you to build certain habits into your life. Like why every five seconds do I pull my phone out of my pocket? Because I've been trained to do so. I've been formed. And there are a million ways that we've done this. We've formed our lives by the culture around us. So we need to be counterformed by intentionally building better habits and rhythms that form us into the image of Jesus in our lives. Do you guys see what I'm saying? And so one of the ways that our culture forms us is not through our intellect, it's through our desires. It's like, hey, don't you want that kind of a life? You look at commercials today. Commercials are not, this product is a nice product, and it does what we say it will do. They literally don't tell you anything about a product anymore. They tell you, this is the kind of person you will be if you buy this product. Don't you want to be this kind of a person? Oh, don't you want to, you're an artistic person. You're not a lame, you know, you know, brainiac person. You're artistic, so you need Apple because our artists have Apple, right? Oh, you're, you're like an athlete, but you got to have Nike. Oh, you can't, you can't really be who you want to be unless you have that, right? It has nothing to do with like how well does it work? Is it worth the money? Does it last long? Who cares? It's about desire, and so part of counterformation is building habits and rhythms that form different desires, better desires in our hearts. And so let me just read over the seven habits we've talked about so far. And I want us to land somewhere very practical. The first habit, and if you miss any of this, you can go watch these on YouTube. But the first is really a framework. It's not really a habit specifically, but I call it the 20 mile march. And this is a framework for how to approach your life and how to build the right habits in your life. And so the 20 mile march is disciplined progress in pursuit of mission. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna be disciplined. I'm gonna have a disciplined lifestyle. Why? Because I wanna pursue the mission of God on my life. And I'm not just gonna have habits that just make me feel good or you know, they're just kinda like what people told me. Oh, I read Atomic Habits, he said I should do this habit. I'm gonna choose the habits that help me pursue the mission of God on my life. And then, some of these habits that we talked about are, are the feast, feasting on the word of God and the presence of God. Training, becoming a disciple who disciples other people. Building the team. This is everywhere you go. I'm not waiting for other people to invite me to be in community. I'm building community everywhere that I go in knowing others and being known by other people. I'm cleaning the slate, practicing repentance, confession, and forgiveness toward myself, with God, and with other people. I'm making the hard choice. I'm building a life of conviction by making hard truths to, to have an anchor of truth and the courage to move in that direction. And lastly, I'm going to use my words. I'm pulling my future into the present with my words for myself and for the people around me. And so my question for you, which of these habits do you need to commit to building over the next period of time? And I just encourage you, we have two months until January 1st. Don't wait till January 1st to build a new habit. Start right now. You got two months. So which habit are you going to commit to for the next two months? Through Thanksgiving, through Christmas, you can give yourself a pass. If you miss it on those days, it's fine. Give you just some cheat days. But what, which of these habits would most radically change your life if you were doing these every day? Which one? If the way that you spoke, if your internal dialogue, if your relationship with other people, would that be the most radically life-changing for you? Maybe feasting on the word of God daily? So pick one. Which one of these are you going to commit to for the next two months? Two, how will you do it and how will you build it into your daily Google calendar? Because just thinking, I'm going to do better, this is not going to happen. You need to schedule it in the same time, in the same place, all seven days a week, no matter what. And if you, get, if you miss a day, you get back on because hitting it 60% of the time is better than hitting it 0% of the time. You're still getting the effect. And so how will you schedule this into your day? And number three, who are you going to tell? Who are you going to tell? Who are you going to bring along on this journey with you? Who's going to help you be accountable? Who's going to ask you? Who's going to ask how it's going or if you've done it? 
You could be like David and Jonathan. I'm going to covenant with your future by helping you build this habit. And in return, you can covenant with my future and help me build this habit I need to build. Okay, so which habit are you committing to for the next two months? How are you going to schedule it into your life? And who are you bringing along with you? Y'all with me? So no, okay. It's, it's all good. It's good to have the feedback to know this wasn't working the whole time, you know. No, I'm kidding. You've got to buy into the vision that God has for your life, that you are made in the image of God. God has an incredible purpose and mission on your life, and it's not going to happen by accident. And so you've got to commit today to build the right kinds of habits and rhythms to become that kind of a person. Okay? Let me pray for us. Holy Spirit, would you come and fill this room here this morning? God, even as, as we just sit here in your presence for one second, God, I have the feeling that many of us, as we talk about words, as we talk about encouragement, many of us have allowed others to put words on us that are not true and are actually holding us back from the purposes of God on our lives. We've come into agreement with judgments, curses people have placed over us, lies people have said about us. Maybe even people that are close to us that would say they love us. But the enemy has used those things. Maybe it's not even a person. Maybe it's just a situation. And we, we interpolated that into some, some reality that we're living in that is not true. And the, the enemy has used that to capture us. We were believing the lie that our failures define us, not God. Our mistakes are bigger and more powerful than the power of God on our life. That praying a prayer is, doesn't really matter. That, that surrendering our life to Jesus, trying to get our life back on track by giving our life to God, that's, that's, that's really just, it's a fool's hope and isn't real. But we've come into agreement with lies that are destroying our lives. Like someone said, words make worlds, words possibly destroy worlds as well, and words have maybe destroyed many of our lives. And, and so we just come to you today, Jesus, and we ask for your power to break into our lives right now and change our futures. Holy Spirit, we give you authority to break off the power of lies we have come into agreement with about our identity, about our life, about our calling, about our, our gifts about all many different aspects of our lives, and we break the power of the enemy over us in Jesus' name. Say, I'm not who I was. I'm who God made me to be. Yes, Jesus, we repent of not using our words well. God, we repent of not being intentional to pursue the life that you have on us. And thank you, Jesus, that you are the champion who goes ahead of us. That your spirit comforts us and guides us and empowers us on this journey. It's not just try harder to do better. But you're leading us. You're more, more involved than, than we are at times. So, God, I pray that you make it clear. God, which of these practices are you leading us to build into our lives to become the man or woman that you've made us to be? In Jesus' name, amen.